welcome back. So, now we discuss uh, some topics about routing. Now that we have already discussed uh, the issues about uh, floor planning and placement, of course, um, with uh, the sub problem of partitioning wherever required. So, now we shall be looking at the very important step of routing, why it is required and what are the different types of routing involved. So, we start with something called grid routing. So, let us see the basic problem of routing to start with. So, as I have said that after cell placement is completed, the cells or the modules are placed on the silicon floor, we have to interconnect all the pins according to the specification of the nets. This process is called routing. Now, once you complete the process of routing, what you do is that you actually determine the precise paths for the wires to run between the pins, so as to connect them. Now, usually this routing is carried out on the metal layers in silicon. So, so in uh, the modern day VLSI technology, there are several metal layers which can be used for interconnecting the different pins which are required to complete the nets. Okay. Now, one very important issue is that routing is important because interconnections in a typical chip can take us to an overhead of almost 30 percent or even more of the design time as well as the area overhead. So, routing is an issue which needs to be given utmost importance and a good placement followed by a good routing step will give us not only smaller design times, but also compact layout area. So, the main objective for routing is to minimize the total area required to lay out the wires. So, broadly we shall be talking about three different kinds of routing. So, let us see in a nutshell what these three different routing processes are. Now, the basic problem is the same, we have a set of blocks or modules which are placed on a surface, two dimensional surface and we have to interconnect some of the pins across them. Okay. So, this problem can be subdivided into three classes or categories, one is called area routing or grid routing. Here, the, the idea is that we have a set of blocks, okay, which can also be regarded as obstacles in the sense that we cannot use those areas for interconnections, for running the lines and a set of pins, which needs to be connected. Grid routing says that we have to find out a good path to interconnect the pins and the entire wiring has to be completed on a single layer. This is a very specific requirement. Okay. Global routing and detail routing goes hand in hand. Global routing says for the more complex problem in the chip where there are many modules or blocks, there are lot of set of pins to interconnect. So, for each of the interconnection nets, you we try to determine the approximate sequence of regions through which the nets should pass through. And once this process is completed, for each of the regions, we have the complete specification of the interconnection or wiring requirements. So, now in this step of detail routing, we actually assign exact horizontal and vertical metal segments in those routing regions, so as to complete the interconnections. Okay. So, the general routing problem you can visualize like this, you have a set of blocks with pins on the boundaries, you have a set of signal nets which need to be connected and these blocks are already placed, locations of the blocks on the layout surface. The objective is of course, to find 
suitable paths through which you can run the wires to connect the pins as required and of course, you have to minimize certain objective criteria. Now, depending on the scenario, depending on your priorities, the objective criteria may be different. So, let us look at some of the more important objective criteria, which people have tried to address and try to optimize. So, you may try to minimize the width of the routing wires or the total area for routing you want to minimize. You want to minimize the separation between adjacent wires wherever possible. Number of routing layers, this way you may try to minimize. Like for example, you may say that well I can complete my routing in a single metal layer, that is the best thing that, that you can have, but we will see later that single layer routing is often not possible. You may require two layers. If you have more than two layers available to you, then possibly you can have more compact or area efficient routing. Of course, of course, the issue of interconnection across layers comes into the picture, that is another problem that you have to address. And of course, the last point is very important, we shall specifically deal with this later. This is we have to complete certain timing constraints. So, let us now come to the problem of area routing or grid routing. So, what does grid routing say? It says that the layout surface is assumed to be made up of a rectangular array of grid cells. So, it is something like this, like I have my rectangular layout surface like this. So, we assume that the total area is divided up into some grid cells arranged in rows and columns. Let us say like this. Now, now, all lines and blocks will be placed aligned to these grid cells. For example, suppose I want to place a block, let us say here. So, it will be placed aligned to this grid cell. This is a block I have placed. Now, suppose I want to run some interconnection lines, let us take some examples. Say I want to run a line like this, this is one interconnection line. I want to run another interconnection lines like this, let us say. Now, means on the surface of the silicon, when you run a set of lines on the same layer, let us say they are running in parallel, then you have to satisfy certain criteria. Criteria like you have to satisfy the minimum width restriction of these lines. These are typically expressed in terms of a basic unit of length called lambda that is called the feature size. Let us say this width restriction has been the separation between these three lines can be these two lines can be three lambda. So, these are the constraints that need to be satisfied. Now, why I am saying is that in this grid representation, the size of each grid, this size of the each grid should be large enough, so that it can contain the line that is running through it and also the separation. So, the idea is that if there are two adjacent grid cells like this, then you can safely run two lines on them parallel to each other without worrying about the width and the separation constraints. The grid cells will be large enough. For example, in this example, the width of the grid cell will be minimum 5 lambda. Okay. So, this is the idea. So, uh, this cells in the grid, they represent as either obstacles or as free cells through which we can run the interconnections. Like some of the blocks 
that are already placed on the two dimension surface they can work as obstacles. So, we shall show them on the grid by coloring them with a dark color and also some of the nets which are already laid out they will also be shown as obstacles be because for future connection of the nets you should not cross these nets which are already laid out. Now, in this routing sub problem as I had mentioned earlier we are trying to find out a single layer path that means, we are not crossing from one metal layer to the other. So, given two points on the two dimension grid we have to find out a sequence of grid cells for connecting from the source point to the destination or, or the target point. So, the problem can be viewed like this in this diagram if you see. So, here we have showed a two dimensional array of cells where this dark blocks represent the obstacles through which you cannot lay the wires. Suppose, I have a source and a target point which I have to connect and let us say some routing algorithm has found out a path like this which is shown shaded. Later on I may be having another set of S and T points which we may want to interconnect. So, during that time these shaded points will be regarded as obstacles because they have already laid out a line here. So, these cells are no longer available for laying out the other pairs of lines. Okay. Now, grid routing algorithms mainly can be classified as maze routing and line search algorithms as we shall see. So, under the maze routing algorithms where we are assuming that uh, the two dimension space is divided into grids or cells as I have just now said. So, two commonly used algorithms shall be discussed Lee's algorithm and Hadlock's algorithm. Then we shall move towards line search algorithm which we will see that they are more efficient in terms of computation time, but may not be that efficient in terms of the quality of solutions. So, here also we shall be looking at a couple of algorithms and finally, a brief look at Steiner tree based approaches shall be uh, discussed. Now, starting with the maze running algorithms, here the entire routing surface is represented by a two dimensional grid of cells. These things I have already mentioned you see here we are assuming that all the pins, all the interconnection wires and also the obstacles which are the bounding boxes for the blocks they are all aligned with respect to the grid lines. Like uh, if we are having a two dimensional array of grid cells everything will be aligned to the grid lines the horizontal and vertical. You cannot place a block so that it is covering half a cell and, uh, and, and half a cell is not covered it is not like that. Everything has to be aligned with respect to the vertical and horizontal boundaries of the cells. So, the size of the cells have to be selected in an appropriate way they should be large enough to as I had said to accommodate the wires when they are running and also the entire wire spacing. So, that two wires can run on two parallel set of grid cells without any minimum separation constant violations. Okay. So, the segments on which the wire runs are also aligned as I had said the size of the grid cells are appropriately defined. So, that wires for different nets can be routed through adjacent cells and if we do proper sizing we are sure that our constraints regarding width and spacing of the lines shall not be violated. And these maze routers they actually connect a single pair of points at a time of course, we shall see later uh, how this restriction can be avoided we can have 
multi point nets as well. So, let us see the process then we shall illustrate it with the help of an example. So, Lee's algorithm is the most basic and the classical maze routing algorithm it is very simple in concept. And some of the very interesting characteristic is that it says if a path exists between the pair of points S and T then it will always be found. Not only that Lee's algorithm guarantees to find the shortest possible path. Essentially it uses breadth first search starting from the start point S it tries to carry out a breadth first search by exploring all the adjacent cells level by level as if a wave front is emanating. You imagine a source of a sound you make a vibration the sound waves start emanating in all directions in the form of wave fronts as if the wave fronts are moving in all directions and it will go on until or unless it touches or finds the target point. So, once it does that you know that this is the shortest distance of the wave front it should travel so as to reach the travel the T point the target point. So, that you can determine or find out the route through which T and S can be connected this is the basic idea. Uh, some of the not so good uh, features of this algorithm is that the time complexity is order n square for an n by n grid. So, you require order n square time not only that also space complexity is order n square because you are representing the entire grid two dimensional grid as a data structure on which you are running the algorithm. So, both time and space complexities are order n square in the worst case. So, Lee's algorithm consists of broadly three phases. Phase 1 says the wave propagation phase, this is an iterative process. So, what is done is that during step i, i starts with 1, 1, 2, 3, in this way you proceed. So, what we do? The grid cells which are at a Manhattan distance of i from the grid cell S are all labeled with i. Now, what does this mean? Let me just illustrate with the help of a simple diagram. Suppose, we have a simple 4 by 4 grid cell. Let us say my point S is here. So, what this process says is that in step i all the cells which are at a Manhattan distance of i we start with i equal to 1 distance of i from s will be labeled with the value i. So, the 4 cells which are lab which are at a Manhattan distance of 1 are here, here, here and here they are all labeled with 1. Then we move to the next step i equal to 2 starting with the cells which are marked as 1 you go to the neighbors. So, the neighbors will represent the cells which are at a Manhattan distance of 2 from S like this. Then you move to i equal to 3 you look at the cells marked with 2 go to the neighbors 3, 3, 3 and 3. So, you see any cell which is marked at 3 as 3 uh, you take any cell let us say you take this it will have a Manhattan distance of 3 up to s take any other 3 1 2 3. So, these labels indicate actually Manhattan distance from the starting point s. So, you carry out labeling the cells like this and this labeling continues until the target cell T has been marked. Let us say we need L number of steps for doing that. So, this L will indicate the length of the shortest path. 
because we are doing a breadth first search with respect to the Manhattan distance, we are visiting all cells at Manhattan distance of 1, then distance 2, then distance 3. In this way we proceed, as soon as we reach the cell with label L, which means we have already reached this cell and L is the minimum number of you can say cells you have to traverse to reach L, that is the shortest path. So, the process will fail if you cannot reach T and you reach a stage where you cannot label any new grid cell in the next step, which means the path does not exist. Or secondly, if, if you have some upper bound m to the length of a path, you say that my path should not be greater than m, then if I see that I has reached m, but still the path is not found then you can conclude that no path of length less than or equal to m exists. This is the phase 1. Now, after we have labeled it phase 2 consists of the retrace phase. So, from the target cell T you systematically backtrack towards the source cell. Now, here one thing you just just understand, let us look at this diagram again, which I have drawn. Let us say, let us consider this cell 3, let us call this was the target. Okay. So, okay, once you have a cell with a label of 3, from 3 you will try to go to a cell with a label of 1 less 2. So, here you see that there are two alternatives, you can either go here or you go here let us say I go here. From this 2 again you go to a cell which is marked as 1. So, here again there are two choices either you can go here or you can come here. Let us say I move here and once I have 1 I know that the adjacent cell of 1 is a S you find out where it is. So, this is the sequence in which you do the backtrace starting from a cell labeled with 3 you go to a cell labeled with 2 labeled with 1 and so on. And as you can see at each step there can be multiple choices or possibilities. So, there is a choice of cells as I said, but you can follow some simple heuristics like you do not try to change the direction unless required. That means, you try to minimize the number of bends. Like for example, from this T to S, uh, you can follow a path like this. But in this example, of course, uh, for, for any path there will be one bend, but you can have a scenario where let us say from S to T, you can have a path either like this or you can have a path like this. both are of the same length, but the second path has more number of bends. Now, in VLAC routing less number of bends the better, because the reliability of the interconnections will be higher in that case. Okay. So, in phase 2 you try to intuitively minimize the number of bends and phase 3 is once we have found out a path you clear all the cells that have been labeled during phase 1 and the path which have been identified you make them as obstacles now, because for the next routing step these cells are already laid out and they will act as obstacles. So, the wave propagation process I have, I have tried to explain the search complexity is the same as the wave propagation process, it goes in a breadth first fashion. So, let us uh, try to work out an example. Let us take a problem instance like this, where I have a set of grid cells, 6 number of rows and 7 number of columns. Some of the cells marked in black are already filled up they are obstacles, you cannot use them for routing. This is your source, this is your target 
and you have to find out a path from the source to the target. So, let us start with the phase 1. Phase 1 for i equal to 1 as I had said you try to find out the cells which are at a distance of 1 from s and label them with 1. There are 3 such cells. In the next step the neighboring cells of 1 will be marked as 2. So, you see this cell will be 2, this is 2, this is 2, this 2 and this 2. So, in this way you proceed in the third step the neighboring cells for 2 like it will be this cell, this cell and this cell they will be marked as 3. Again in the next step this will be 4, this will be 4 and this will be 4 like this. Then 5, this will be 5, this will be 5, this will be 5, 5. Then this will be 6, this will be 6, this will be 6 and this will be 6, this 4 cells. Then 7, 1, 2, 3, 4, 4 cells will be 7. So, in this way you go on and you see that you have reached the stage where the 7, the cell you have labeled is adjacent to the target. So, you have reached the target. So, from here you can retrace the path from T to S to find out the solution. Now, you see there are two alternatives either you can follow a path like this, like this, like this or you can follow 7, 6, 5, then 4, then 3, 2, 1. So, here you have another bend here, but as I said the rule of thumb is not to change direction as long as it is not required. So, from 7 you try to find out an adjacent cell 6 which is in the same direction like this is the retrace phase. Then from 6 you try to find out a cell with level 5, then 5 to 4, then you see in the same direction nothing is there, then you look for a neighbor with a label of 3, it is on this side 3, then again look for 2, look for 1, then you know S is adjacent. So, you got a path right. So, this is your phase 2. Now, after this phase is completed, so what you do during the third phase? Third phase you clear all the labels and what I have said that whatever path you have found out, this will be marked as obstacles now. Now, in the next step may be you will be having another pair let us say this cell will be your source, this cell will be your target, then again you will be starting the wave front propagation from the source where these cells will be marked as target. Now, you see we have uh, discussed a method which is simple in concept and also it guarantees that it will give you the minimum length solution or the shortest path whenever it can find one, because you are exploring all paths parallelly at each step, distance of 1, distance of 2, distance of 3, all the cells which are at a distance of i you are considering in parallel. So, if a shortest path of length L exists after L steps you are guaranteed to find that path and it will touch that point. So, in our next lecture we shall look at uh, some issues regarding the memory requirements of this scheme, how much memory it can require some simple calculations and some ways in which you can reduce the time as well as the memory or, or mean storage complexity in this algorithm. So, with this we come to the end of this lecture. Thank you.